Hello. So we are going to start because uh, one of our guest speaker has to run and go testify at uh, the Parliament Hill. So we would love to have him, and we would love him also to go there. So, <laughs> so uh, we want the both of the two worlds, and uh, we are kind of a little bit rushing you, but uh, it's uh, just uh, six thirty, and uh, we would like to start as soon as possible. Um, I would like to, uh, first of all, introduce myself. My name is Monia Mazig, and I have the honor this evening to moderate this session. Uh, I am a human rights activist, I'm an author, and I live in Ottawa, and I feel really uh, privileged and honored to be moderating this extremely talented panel uh, with the three uh, expert, real expert, right? <laughs> I'm referring to, uh, I don't know if you, you heard about uh, our minister, <laughs> uh, security, uh, Public Security Minister, who said there are so-called experts, but we have here a real expert uh, who are going to enlighten us about uh, a very important issue, um, which is the uh, the right to to, to be uh, a citizen and the right to have a state, and the issue of also coming so much uh, quick uh, quick with the, with the government. Uh, that started uh, the Bill C-24 uh, being stateless. And of course, uh, the focus point of this evening is going to be the case of Mr. D. Pan, who is here, and uh, his lawyer, uh, Yavar Hamid, will also uh, talk specifically about this case. So without really any uh, more um, introduction, I can introduce more the event later on, but we would like to hear Alex Neeb. I'm going to very, very quickly um, give a little bit um, of his background. Well, I know he's very known here in town and even like all across Canada and overseas. He's the Secretary General of Amnesty International and Alex uh, Neeb uh, actually appeared before the G8, the Summit of the Americas, various parliamentary committee as today, as well as before the United uh, Nations and various inter-American human rights bodies. Alex is an expert on international human rights law, and he was awarded the Order of Canada in 2007, and was also awarded an honorary doctorate of laws from the University of New Brunswick in 2009. So please uh, welcome Alex Lee. Thank you so much, Monia. And yes, my apologies. Uh, certainly, whenever it was four months ago when Deepan was uh, very astutely planning this evening, I had no inkling that we are going to be in the middle of this volatile and very troubling national debate about national security reforms in Canada. And they give you the time they give you, and I have to testify at 7.30. Uh, so that's why the need for a bit of a rush. But I'm glad that it does still fit and I can share with you some of the reflections that Amnesty International has. Obviously from a particular perspective, I think you'll hear a variety of perspectives here. Uh, ours is going to be the international human rights perspective. Um, and obviously there are many troubling injustices that come to the fore uh, when you hear about Deepan's case. It's one of those situations that when you hear it, you just fundamentally know that it's, it's wrong. It's simply wrong, it's unfair, and it's unjust. How can it be that someone who was born in Canada, someone who has lived in Canada all his life, someone who has of course never thought of himself as anything other than Canadian, who has twice in the past either been listed on or had his own Canadian passport, who has no meaningful connections with any other country, and whose family all live here as Canadian citizens, adds up to quite a bit, doesn't it? How can that person not be Canadian himself? Um, well, there's a side to Deepan's case, of course, that is all about legal provisions, interpreting the law, weighing the evidence, who was his family working for when he was born, whose evidence do you believe, and what does that mean in terms of whether he was or was not a citizen at birth? And if the evidence goes against him, not that I say it does, 
But if it does, what are the legal implications of the fact that he was recognized to be and was treated as and even allowed to live as a Canadian citizen with Canadian passports for so many years? So there's lots there, and I'm sure others, uh, and maybe Deepan himself, will be touching on some of that. But I want to zero in on the fundamental international human rights issues that are at stake in Deepan's case. Um, and it actually all begins with one fundamental and very important human right, and that's the right to a nationality. Uh, because that is fundamentally what is at stake here. Uh, and for a source here, let's go back to where the current international human rights system began. And that takes us back to 1948, uh, which is when the UN adopted the world's most precious uh, international human rights instrument, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And there it is, right at the beginning, as governments are crafting the international human rights order. Article 15. Everyone, it's a pretty clear word, has the right to a nationality. And it actually goes on to say that no one, also a pretty clear word, shall be arbitrarily deprived of his or her nationality. So nationality, I mean, what, are we, what do we mean when we're talking about nationality? And I think it's really important to underscore it's, it's not just some simple formality. It's not just about paperwork and bureaucratic formalities and you know, wanting to have some country that you can put on the line when you're always asked, you, know, you are a citizen of what? It is so important, fundamentally important, for a number of reasons, and I think we, it, it, it's worth reminding ourselves of that. Essentially, at its very core, it matters so much because it is about identity. Nationality matters because it provides identity, a whole variety of different kinds of identity. Legal identity, political identity, cultural identity. Uh, and identity is so essential uh, in so many different ways. Nationality obviously offers a passport. Uh, and that's not just a nice thing. A passport is a ticket to rights, uh, because a passport is what makes it possible to travel in this world of ours. And that's not just about wanting to be able to go on nice vacations. Travel is instrumental so often, especially in this interconnected world of ours, to being able to pursue employment. Uh, it may be necessary to keep families in touch with each other. Uh, there's a whole host of rights-related reasons that that matters. Nationality matters because it's, I think we should sort of think of it as the gateway or the key, the guarantor, actually, of many other rights. Um, it's the guarantor, it's what provides us with the right to vote, uh, the right to be able to participate fully in all aspects of government, uh, to be able to leave and return to a country. You can always leave, return matters a lot. Uh, and it is the gateway to certain other rights, fundamentally important rights, uh, such as education, health care, employment, and social assistance, all of which may have various kinds of restrictions and limitations without a nationality. Nationality matters as well because it means there is a government to whom you can turn for assistance, for support, for protection, when you face problems, when you have needs, uh, and that's particularly important when you may be abroad. But there is a government that has that obligation to you. And nationality matters perhaps most fundamentally because it means there is a place in your life that is home, a place that accepts you, a place to turn to when you may have nowhere else to turn. And maybe bringing it back to that first idea of identity, it's a place where you belong. So given all of that, it's not surprising that we see the right to a nationality enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, because it matters so very much. And at an international level, uh, it's important, therefore, to note that the companion to Article 15 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the right to a nationality, is the obligation and responsibility that governments have to avoid prevent and reduce statelessness, which is the opposite of having a nationality. 
And the international community has done so twice, and they've gone into some detail in doing so by adopting two very important treaties at the level of the United Nations, both of which are overseen, and this is kind of an interesting fact, by the UN's Refugee Agency, uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, recognizing that the two issues often, but not always, do go hand in hand with stateless people being forced from countries and having nowhere to turn to and being sort of lost in the international system and at risk. <laughs> the UNHCR uh, recently has become increasingly alarmed that statelessness, far from diminishing, we've had these treaties in place for a few decades now, has actually been on the rise. Uh, and the UNHCR tells us that right now, in our world, there are about 10 million stateless people in the world, and this is an interesting statistic, and that a child is born stateless in the world somewhere every 10 minutes. They have therefore launched a major campaign in an attempt to... Tension exists between the human right to nationality and a global system that supports the institution of sovereign states and states' rights to control membership and determine who may and who may not have access to citizenship. Citizenship, the right to have rights, is a little like housework. Its benefits to the individual are most noticeable in its absence. The person who suffers citizenship deprivation is denied health care, access to education, employment opportunities, social services, mobility rights, family benefits, indeed a right to a family. The rights, as T.H. Marshall some 65 years ago delineated, quote, to a modicum of economic welfare and security and to live the life of a civilized being according to the standards prevailing in the society. Being stateless is political death, which makes efforts to obtain all of the goods and services necessary for survival. Indeed, survival itself, an arduous chore met with suspicion and likely incredulity by every state bureaucracy a stateless person encounters. Which brings us to Deepan, whose deprivation of citizenship occurred not in the context of migration. I find it interesting that the response to Amnesty International is that they're upholding the immigration laws. Deepan is not an immigrant. The deprivation of citizenship occurred in situ and in stasis in Canada and without crossing borders. Deepan was born in Ottawa, possessed a Canadian birth certificate, and believed for some 20 years in good faith that he was a Canadian citizen, a belief that was supported by the Canadian government, which issued him two Canadian passports. His official documents seized by the government, Deepan, is more of an undocumented familiar rather than an undocumented alien. His parents are both naturalized Canadians, I believe they have a sibling as well, who's a naturalized Canadian, which strongly suggests that all parties involved in the process of granting citizenship accepted Deepan's birthright Canadian citizenship. The revocation of citizenship among Canadian-born Canadian citizens is unusual, but it's not without historical precedent, and often has been motivated by ideology and politics. So the revocation was used, for instance, in the 1930s in an anti-communist crackdown to deport uh, dangerous European uh, foreigners. At the end of the Second World War, the Liberal government denationalized in order to deport to Japan thousands of Canadian citizens and non-citizens of Japanese descent, many of whom had never been to Japan. Currently, citizenship revocation of naturalized citizens is used to deter terrorism and punish terrorists, both in the former Bill C-24 and the current Bill uh, C-51. And one can speculate uh, that with the passage of Bill C-51, the Harper government is trying to use Deepan as a precedent to denationalize in order to deport Canadian-born Omar Khadr. But as Audrey Macklin points out, if the practical aim of citizenship revocation and exile makes Canada more secure, 
by removing dangerous people, the justification knows no bounds. Why not make Canada safer for law-abiding citizens by exiling all violent criminals, or indeed all Canadians, who contravene the criminal code? Indeed, this type of thinking is reflected in the statement of Alexis Pav uh, Pavlich, press secretary for the CIC, when he argues, quote, he should not have chosen a life of crime if he did not want to be deported from Canada. Mr. Butlikoti is being removed from Canada for serious criminality. So I'll leave it for the criminologist to make the argument about double punishment and the punitive character of citizenship revocation that punishes manyfold those convicted criminals who have served their time for crimes committed as Deepan has by revoking their citizenship and rendering them stateless. But it's important, I think, to examine another double punishment that the federal government has reserved for Deepan in the non-recognition of his birthright. Canadian citizenship. Citizenship is far more, as uh, Alex had pointed out, than a piece of paper or a mere legal bond between state and individual, albeit that legal state is fundamental to the enjoyment of even basic human rights. It is also the lived experience of that legal bond, or what the International Court of Justice in the Nottebaum case referred to as the social fact of attachment. And in this sense, as Audrey Macklin argues, citizenship is not <coughs> fungible or replaceable one for the other. As the lived experience of citizenship pertains to particular attachment, to particular states, territories, peoples, cultures, networks, weather, landscapes, baskets of social benefits, which makes the relationship between a state and a citizen as singular and unique. Deepen's life since birth has been in Canada. He is the product of Canadian conditions his entire life. Why have not his strong claims to rights of place and protection by the state not been reflected in the adjudication of his case? This leads to a question of the assumed second punitive step of citizenship revocation, and that is exile. There's nowhere else to go. But exiles to, exile to where? Since repa repatriation to his parents' homeland is not an option according to that homeland India, there is only the possibility of indefinite internal displacement or permanent alienage of this undocumented familiar. This is what I find so deeply troubling about the September 2014 federal court decision of Justice Phelan in upholding the revocation of Deepan's citizenship on the technicality of a contested fact, the date when his parents ceased being diplomatic staff in relation to the date of Deepan's birth. This decision relies only on the thinnest notion of citizenship, one that fails to acknowledge that citizenship involves embeddedness of individuals in a network of relationships that include both the public sphere and civil society in a particular place. There is no recognition that citizenship for Deepan since birth involved 20 years of lived experience. And social and effective attachments and the disproportionate harm that is rendered by depriving him of this specific citizenship. The decision skirts the issue that the home country of his parents will not recognize him by arguing that it's reasonable to assume that in most cases the children of the staff of diplo foreign diplomats can access their parents' homeland citizenship. Even if India provided him with some legal recognition, which they have not, Deepan has no social or effective ties with any country other than Canada. By revoking Deepan's citizenship, the Canadian government inflicts an intrinsically grave harm that is separate from though exacerbated by the harm of statelessness. So this is another type of double punishment. Deep in statelessness, despite 20 years of citizenship recognition, undermines a key assumption about citizenship in a democratic state. Namely, 
that it is inalienable unless an individual wishes to relinquish it. This is why we need to care about what happens to DPAN and what and how the state is doing to DPAN in creating his statelessness and in the process undermining the inalienability of citizenship. To quote Audrey Macklin, citizenship revocation schemes mean that citizenship is now emerging as, quote, an enhanced form of conditional permanent residence, revocable through the exercise of executive decisions. This diminishes citizenship such that on the continuum from absolute security to absolute precarity, no one is absolutely secure. We need more understanding of statelessness, the processes which produce it and the harm that it creates in the Canadian and other contexts. As Linda Kerber in the US context opines, stateless today is most usefully understood not as a status, but as a practice made and remade in daily decisions of presidents and judges, border guards and prison guards, managers and pimps. The stateless are the citizens other. The stateless serve the state by signaling who will not be entitled to its protection and throwing fear into the rest of us. We need to care about the debate about whether citizenship is a right or a privilege. As defined by the current and the past Minister of Citizenship and Immigration, as a privilege that can be forfeited by bad behavior. Revert 1989. Uh, that's, that's really the, the sticking point. And um, what the government maintains is, is that his parents uh, were working for uh, the, the embassy or the, the, the mission of India at that time. So while they are working, they're, they're em employed in that relationship, uh, they're uh, their child, their, their children, during that time period uh, fall outside of the normal, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, method, or the, 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 the normal way in which uh, citizenship uh, devolves under the Citizenship Act. That's, that's regular and we don't contest that because that's, that's how the statute works. But uh, the, the fact is that um, uh, Deepan's parents left uh, the, the employee of uh, the High Commission prior to, in fact, uh, uh, at least uh, um, two to three months uh, before uh, his birth and were working uh, for a Canadian citizen. Uh, we have uh, a, a, a statement uh, that was uh, signed uh, at the time, just a couple of days after his birth, which shows where uh, his, his parents were working at the time. Uh, the, the Government of Canada, what, what they have done is they have released a diplomatic note uh, which dates back from 1989, which we had never seen, Deepan had never seen this uh, in his life, was just disclosed in the context of this litigation to say that the employment relationship uh, was one that continued up until December. This is a note that was authored uh, by the High Commission of India, and so we said, look, we've never seen this before, so why don't we go and, and talk to the person who was the High Commissioner of India at the time? So we actually went, we sought the guy out in India, uh, we got him to swear an affidavit, and he said, you know what, I was going to end my term as High Commissioner, therefore I preemptively said, uh, you know, you can, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're done with my service, and you can uh, start, uh, you know, working uh, in, in the Canadian public with an individual by the name of Dr. Deheja. So we had both an affidavit uh, from uh, Mr. Chatwal, who is now, he, he uh, fortunately, he's, he's now deceased. He gave his evidence, he swore an affidavit. It's the best evidence available, <coughs> saying that this was an error. I was the High Commissioner, and uh, his subsequent employer, Dr. Deheja. So we have this, you know, uh, this sworn evidence before the court, and the court says, well, you know what, we prefer the other document. Um, in, in terms of law, uh, that is just, uh, it, it's, it's not what's called the, the best evidence. The best evidence is a sworn statement. Uh, what 